Hey everyone, James from Zaggle Studios here, and today I come at you with a new segment called Performance Programming, where I, James from Zaggle Studios, take a piece of code and make it as fast as possible. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel. It helps me a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. And if you have a piece of code you want me to optimize, send it my way. I'd be happy to do it and feature it in the next video. Fake Reddit user one says, hey James from Zygle Studios. I'm reaching out to you today because I have a problem. I'm working on a project right now and the team isolated a piece of code that is slowing down the entire system. And unfortunately, I wrote that code. Can you help me figure out why it's so slow? Well, Mr. Fake Reddit user one, absolutely I can. Let's take a look. Okay, so let's take a look at the code here, see if we can figure out what's going on. So it looks like the function name is meaningful, meaning it says copy sign. So we're copying some sign here. We've got two parameters uh, for the scope of the function. There's float x and float y. So I wonder if we're copying the sign from one to another. Let's look. We look at the first conditional, basically checking to see if y is less than zero, meaning y is negative, and x is less than zero, meaning x is negative, we return x. So this line really doesn't tell us a whole lot, but let's continue on to the next one. The next one is an else if conditional saying, if y is less than zero, and if x is greater than zero, we want to return negative x, or if the converse is true, we want to return negative x as well. So it looks like we're copying the sign from y and placing it onto x. So as we've seen from this particular piece of code, all it's trying to do is take the sign of y and move it into the sign of x. And this seems kind of overkill considering you shouldn't need conditionals at all. Let me explain why. In order to make something as good as it can possibly be, we also have to take a look at the simplest approach because sometimes the simplest is the most elegant and most efficient way of doing things. So if we're trying to copy the sign from the floating point number y into the floating point number x, we should probably take a look at what floats are made up of, because if we do, maybe we can find something. Going by the IEEE 754 standard, floats are 32 bits long. These 32 bits have bit fields that represent a specific part of the float. So the first bit is the sign bit, the second portion of it is the exponent area, and the third portion of it is the mantissa. And each of these three things can calculate a number much larger than a typical unsigned 32-bit integer or signed 32-bit integer. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the float because we really don't need it. All we need is that sign bit. If we can somehow copy the sign bit from y into the sign bit of x, we don't need conditionals at all. We can just use bit manipulation operations, which will be infinitely faster, and not only that, but more consistent due to the pipeline structure of most of these systems. So now you've seen exactly why a floating point number, is which is 32 bits long, is simply just a sequence of bits that are represented in a special format. There's nothing really that specifically complicated about it. It's just, you have to understand how it's broken down. Now, here's the kicker. In order to do this function, all you need is to flip the first bit in the floating point number itself. But here's the problem. Bit manipulations don't technically work with floating point numbers in the C language anyway. So how can we get around this? Well, there's this wonderful thing in the C language called casting and multiple indirection, which is used across all disciplines of programming. Let me show you how I did it and how much performance it can potentially save you. Okay, so let's take a look at this function that I made that does the exact same thing as the other previous result and break it down. So we still have the same two parameters coming in here. So functionally outside of here, the programmers that use this function will know that it, the same thing will essentially work from the inside out. So the same result comes back. The first thing I do is I declare a variable of 32 bits long on the stack and initialize it to zero to create a memory container for this float result. The next thing I do is I or in a large bit mask result. Now let me break down what I'm doing here. So the first thing I do is I use multiple indirection and casting in order to manipulate the bits inside the floating point number. The first thing I do is I cast it as a 32 bit pointer at the address of y. And then essentially by putting the star in front or the dereferencing character, I am now manipulating the contents at the address of y in a 32-bit container. As we can see here, this number is a 32-bit number. 
There's 32 slots here. And the first bit is set here. So effectively what I'm doing here is I'm anding y, the result that we want to take and put into x, and masking everything out besides that first bit. I want to get rid of all upper 31 bits and only have that one left. So that's essentially what I'm doing with y, is I'm totally removing and squashing that result and only retaining the upper one bit. The next thing I'm doing is I'm adding that in to x, where we want to place our sign. And what this does, it uses the same multiple indirection. So I'm taking the contents at the location of x inside of this 32-bit container. And essentially what I'm doing now is I'm anding in at the 32nd bit the result here from the or. So I'm clearing the result there and then anding in the new one. But now that we're done with that, we need to return it as a float so the person using this function is none the wiser. So what do we do? We use our friend multiple indirection again. I then cast the temporary variable that I have just created using x and y in the same fashion that I do here, only I change it back to a float. I cast it as a pointer to a float and then change the contents so the compiler knows the contents of temp are now a float again and I can now return it. So now here's the real kicker. Does this solution actually yield better results? Well, there's one way we can find out. So I'm using an STM32 F4 Discovery microcontroller that I have laying around to test this out. And I have, I have an evaluation license of Keel here for uh, ARMS debugger and IDE for non-production use to demonstrate this. So I have an old clock project, which I will actually show on the channel later, but not today. And we're just going to look at how I took uh, these two functions, the same exact ones that we were looking at before, and categorized them by performance. Basically what I'm doing is I'm taking averages and trying to understand what takes longer and the frequency at which it takes longer or less longer. I'm setting up instructional and data synchronization barriers to ensure that no memory accesses or instructions are being sent in the pipeline when each of these operations are doing from beginning to end because it could prevent uh, some pipeline interlock requests from occurring due to instructions in the pipeline so I will flush the pipeline as well as unnecessary accesses to memory. So we will strictly be doing um, these particular functions in for loops on large iterations to see how they pan out. So I made a max loops timer here. So let's do a thousand and see what happens. So if I if I run the debugger here, we can uh, we've got a giant a nice giant watch window here, and I basically have two um, different structs keeping track of the performance. So the conditional performance is going to be what the original one was, and the bitwise one is going to be the solution I just showed you. So let's run this thing and see what happens. So as we hit the run button, we can start to see the average time populate. So the average time is the average time this operation takes. So if we look at the bitwise uh, if we look at the bitwise performance, it's consistently almost half of what the conditional one is. And this is on a smaller scale. So now let's try bumping it up. So if we make something ridiculous, like if we call it at scale, let's do say 10,000. We can now see the process time has really pretty much linearly increased and we can essentially see the difference here. So this time is in milliseconds. I probably should have mentioned that to begin with. So two, 0.9 milliseconds versus 4.4 is quite a big difference, especially on this level. We want millisecond time differences are huge. In a real-time system, you need these extra few milliseconds to process things accordingly. If you notice, I'm actually keeping track here about which one is longer. The fast, or F, is longer, is zero, and the original one is longer each time. So the larger or higher we go, the more you'll see this result, the more you'll see this weighing on the conditional taking much longer. But why is that? Well, luckily, we can take a look at the debugger here in the assembly code to see why this is the case. So if we go to copy sign, we can take a look at how many instructions are actually needed in order to get this done. So this is the original one, and if you notice, there's a lot of branching instructions, and branching instructions could potentially be detrimental if the jump addresses aren't computed the way they need to be and it requires something like a translational look aside buffer to correct the address jump table to go to the right address. 
this can result in what's called a pipeline stall and the interlock request will happen until it is fulfilled so that means that if the jump address is wrong it needs to be rectified to go to the right spot and once that's over the stall is done with these m4 processors or cores they're typically not that big of a deal because the pipelines are smaller but you'll still see a larger increase in performance from avoiding branches in any system so let's take a look at my technique and see how it fares against this notice this is a heck of a lot smaller in terms of code so really if we're talking about this the primary reason this is a lot faster is because this is six less instructions than the other method you can see here there's also no branching involved either so it's more predictable in terms of how it works in a pipeline system we have a bit clear instruction, a vmove instruction, an or instruction, and an and instruction, and then a final vmove instruction to get it back into a floating point number versus a bunch of branches in order to figure things out. So it's amazing how simple you can make things if you just break it down and solve the problem organically rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. If you only need one bit of information to solve this problem, why use more than that to even come up with the scope of it? It seems like a no-brainer, but this is more common than you might think. And especially with risk systems that have larger penalties in terms of pipeline stall, well, you can end up in some trouble, especially in high performance or real-time systems. So not only did you find out how I approach this problem, but also the techniques I use to monitor performance on some of these pieces of code. I hope this was helpful for you, and I hope you enjoyed Performance Programming Episode 1. If you have a piece of code that you want me to optimize or look at, Send it my way, because the next video you might be featured in. If you enjoyed this, drop a like, or drop a comment if you'd like me to cover a particular topic or piece of code that you find online in the future. If you could, please subscribe, because it helps me a lot, and I appreciate all the support. I hope to see you guys in the next video, and this is James from Zygal Studios, signing off.